Our understanding of history isn't so much a gathering of verified facts as it is a collage of guesswork. People have an unfortunate habit of underestimating the capabilities of our ancient ancestors, but we have a cure for that. The cure is to look at the incredible inventions and technologies that they came up with, which is precisely what we're going to do in this video. The entire site of Baalbek in Lebanon is both an archaeological wonder and an archaeological mystery, but it's the megalithic cut stones in the quarry there that provide us with the biggest mystery of all. One of them, the Southern Rock, weighs approximately 900 tons. There's no clear indication of what the rocks were needed for, why they were cut at such a size, and how anyone living in ancient times could possibly have dreamed of moving them anywhere after they were cut. The Western Rock is even bigger, weighing around 1,100 tons. One theory says that they were supposed to become part of Baalbek's trilithon, but as the site of the trilithon is uphill from the quarry, an inconceivable amount of power would be required to drag or push them up the hill. We can't even say for sure who performed the cutting work. The ancient Romans are generally credited for it, but we haven't seen any evidence of them attempting to quarry such enormous megaliths anywhere else across their old empire. This would be considered too difficult a construction project to attempt today, let alone thousands of years ago. Archaeologists have been digging at the site of Ayana's castle in Turkey for more than 30 years. During that time, they've rarely found anything more significant or unique than the ornamental bronze wall plate that was found there in September 2022. The castle is a hotspot for treasure hunters because it was built for the Eurasian king Rusa II, who ruled his territories from there between the years 680 and 693 BCE. The bronze plate is likely to have been chosen personally by the king, or a member of the royal family, and would have hung on a wall as a decoration. Fragments of similar plates have been found elsewhere in and around the ruins of the castle, but this is the only one that's ever come out of the ground in one piece. The discovery of the bronze plate came as archaeologists identified and unearthed four new interconnected rooms buried into the hillside that the castle was once perched atop, and there's still plenty of work to be done inside those rooms. Experts say there's so much digging to be done at Ayanis Castle that there will still be archaeologists there for another 30 years. Religious iconography is usually a labor of love for whoever makes it, but even taking that into account, these miniature boxwood carvings are incredibly sophisticated. Only 135 of the sculptures, which are also sometimes called prayer nuts, have ever been found, all of which were made between 1500 and 1530 in the Netherlands. That suggests that they may even have all been the work of one person. The tiny altars are held together by piercings so small that the joints are completely hidden. We've only been able to determine how they were put together using x-rays and microscopes, but the fact that we need such advanced technology to determine how they were made begs the question of how someone could have put them together without the use of such technology in the first place. The pins that keep everything in place are smaller than a seed of grass. The human eye is incapable of even seeing them, so how could human hands have moved them into place with such precision? Is someone in the Netherlands hiding an ancient x-ray machine? The only other explanation is that the person who made them was so incredibly short-sighted, they would have been almost blind to anything more than a foot or two away from their face. The Dolmen de Soto is a 5,000-year-old Spanish mystery that's unlikely to be solved anytime soon. There are around 200 Neolithic era ritual burial sites in the Spanish province of Huelva, but none are quite as magnificent as this incredible subterranean structure. The name Dolmen de Soto comes from Armando de Soto Morales, who discovered the enormous passage tomb as he attempted to build a new house on his land in Andalusia in 1922. The great German archaeologist Hugo Obermeier was summoned to the site to excavate it, and he found eight sets of human remains buried in fetal positions, 
surrounded by grave goods. The goods include cups, daggers, and marine fossils. Burying people with marine fossils is an unusual practice that has never been noted in Spain before, and the meaning of it is unknown. Just as mysterious are the 43 standing stones that surround the dolmen, each of which is covered in engraving showing knives, cups, human figures, and abstract shapes. 100 years after the discovery, we still know nothing about who was buried here or what any of the carefully engraved symbols mean in relation to the burials. There's a Paleo-Christian necropolis in Autun, France, that's been giving up fascinating goods for several months now. In July 2022, it gave up its latest treasures when fragments of purple and gold fabric dating back to the 4th century were found within the necropolis. The gold in the fabric is literally gold thread, Experts have spent the past few weeks cleaning the delicate fabrics and have now learned new details about the weave and the material it's made from. The textiles came from Tomb 47 within the enormous necropolis and were surprising discoveries found within large clods of earth. The cleaning process has revealed floral and herringbone weaving patterns within the fabric, displaying a surprising level of complexity for the era. Rather than being garments that were worn by the people buried in the necropolis while they were alive, experts think it's likely that they were made specially for burial. That begs the question of why the deceased weren't dressed in them when they were buried, which is a question nobody's been able to come up with a good answer for yet. Making the garments required a high level of technical mastery, so it seems odd that someone would choose to leave them on the ground. At this point, as we're slowly coming to accept that our ancient ancestors had a better understanding of technology than we usually give them credit for, does it become possible to believe that they might even have understood the basic principles of electricity? That question has to be asked because of the existence of the Baghdad battery, which was found in Iraq way back in 1838. While historians tend to reject the idea that it's a battery, it's almost impossible to understand the artifact any other way. It's a clay jar that houses a rod of iron, around which is a copper wrapping. There wouldn't be much point in creating it as an ornament if it couldn't be seen unless the jar was opened, and it would be an odd-looking ornament anyway. The Baghdad battery has been tested under lab conditions and proven to be capable of holding a charge. That poses a huge historical problem because the artifact is more than 2,000 years old. Were these ancient people really experimenting with electricity? And if so, why didn't they take the idea any further? We haven't talked much about the ancient Romans thus far in this video, but that's about to change. Take a good look at the Lycurgus cup. Is it green or is it red? Actually, it's both. The color you see depends on what angle you look at it from and what direction the light that hits it comes from. The stunning visual effect is down to the fact that microscopic particles of gold and silver were added during the glass-making stage. The particles are only 50 nanometers in diameter, so we can say that the Romans invented nanotechnology. As each particle is 1,000 times smaller than the average grain of salt, we have no idea how the Roman genius responsible for the invention of this cup was able to work with them. They certainly didn't have a microscope for assistance 1,600 years ago. The chances of the particles getting into the mix by accident are non-existent, so whoever made this beautiful decorative glass knew exactly what they were doing. They might have been the only person in the Roman Empire who did, though. Nothing like this has ever been found anywhere else within former Roman territories. Speaking of the Romans, there are some who believe they visited the Americas in ancient times. In support of that theory, we present the Tecoxix Calixhuahuaca head. The weather head sculpture was buried in Mexico somewhere around the year 1470, probably just before Columbus arrived in the Americas, as part of a grave. All the other goods that were found inside the tomb were typical for the era and the type of burial, but this head is not. In fact, the only thing this head could be compared to is the kind of sculpture style that was once popular in ancient Rome. 
Even the face on the sculpture appears to be more European in style than Native American. The head was found by archaeologist Jose Garcia Payon in 1933 beneath a pyramid, but it shocked him so much that he didn't reveal it to the wider world until 1960. In 2001, Romeo H. Christoph of the University of New Mexico confirmed that the head is definitely Roman and was probably made during the second century. That begs the question of how it came to be in Mexico in pre-Columbian times. Did the Vikings bring it here when they visited the Americas, or were the Romans once here too? There's a lot we can say about the Antikythera mechanism. We can tell you that it's Greek. It was found in the middle of a shipwreck and it's approximately 2,000 years old. What we can't tell you is how it worked or what it was used for, and neither can any expert who's ever been given a chance to examine it. We hesitate to describe the device as being powered by clockwork because such a concept should have been impossible to understand for the people of the time, but it had a clockwork-like mechanical system that enabled it to track the position of planets and stars in the sky at night. The fact that it was found on a ship might suggest that it has a nautical use, but if that were the case, we'd expect to find similar devices on many other Greek shipwrecks of this era. We never have, and so it might be the case that it was a brand new invention when the ship went down, and as its owner likely went to the bottom of the sea with it, and so nothing like it was created again for almost 1,000 years. It would be very useful to know when earthquakes were coming. Areas could be evacuated ahead of a disaster occurring, and countless lives could be saved. We struggle to predict earthquakes here in the 21st century even with all the wonderful technology we have at our disposal, and yet the ancient Chinese were trying to make such predictions during the second century. They used devices like this seismograph, made by Shang Heng in the year 132. While it might look like an elaborately decorated vase, Zhang Heng's device is incredibly sensitive and sophisticated. When placed on the ground, it can detect tremors occurring miles away, which swing a pendulum inside the artifact. Should the swing go beyond a certain safety level, it dislodges one of the balls inside the mouths of the dragons attached to the seismograph's sides, dropping the ball into the mouth of a frog. This not only tells observers an earthquake is coming, but also gives them an idea of which direction it's coming from. It probably wasn't all that accurate in terms of predicting directions, and it wouldn't have given much notice, but it was certainly better than having no warning at all. Italian Renaissance master Leonardo da Vinci has a strong claim to having the greatest mind in human history. The polymath was light years ahead of his time in art, science, biology, and sculpting, and it appears that he could predict the future of military combat, too. Long before a tank ever rolled across the fields of Europe, or anywhere else in the world for that matter, da Vinci had come up with a basic idea of what they might look like. He never built a prototype based on his design, but the fundamental principles of it are sound. The da Vinci tank had space for outward-facing blunderbusses and a removable top section that could be opened to aid the vision of the driver. The wheels were probably too thin to be of any use in a muddy field, and the crank design of the axle looks faulty, but we shouldn't hold that against him. A wooden tank probably wouldn't have lasted long on the battlefield, but this design is a basic blueprint for the future. In fact, a group of engineers was able to successfully build a working model of the tank based on da Vinci's blueprints in 2010. The odometer in your car keeps track of how much distance you cover when you drive. Speaking more generally, an odometer can be used to determine the distance from one place to another. When it was invented, it revolutionized map making and route planning in the ancient world. We have Vitruvius of ancient Rome to thank for inventing the odometer, a task he completed just over 2,000 years ago. His first odometer looked a little like a wheelbarrow with one enlarged wheel full of pebbles. Every time the wheel rotated, one pebble was dropped into a small bucket beneath the device. As Vitruvius measured the precise diameter of the wheel before he fitted it to the device, he knew exactly how much distance was covered by each rotation. 
He could therefore determine the distance between two points by counting the number of pebbles that the odometer deposited into the bucket. After he came up with this genius invention, journey planning in the Roman Empire no longer involved quite so much guesswork, and maps became far more accurate. The odometers of today may no longer use pebbles, but they still work on the same 2,000-year-old principle. Subscribe to the channel, turn on the notification bell, and enjoy watching new videos on my channel. Thanks for watching and see you soon!